Hi, everyone. We have a special episode today. We're joined by Lance Bell, who has a, a very important and distressing story. This is something that's been going on in his life for over two decades now. His brother and two other men have been locked up for almost 20 years. And this is the first of a series we want to do. And the, and the, and the big important question is, are these men innocent? Was, was there a huge miscarriage of justice here because of just politics and just like a railroading of the justice system that really shouldn't be tolerated? That this is why we're doing this episode. So this one's very serious, but yeah. So Lance, thank you for joining us today. I, can, I can't imagine what you've gone through with this. This, is, this sounds like an absolute nightmare. Yes, thank you for having me. Can you hear me very clear? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. Yes, thank you for having me. And it, um, yes, it has been a nightmare. It's been 23 years now. So I was six years old when this happened. I'm 28 now. So these last, my, you could say my adult life, since I've been aware of the situation, it's been real turmoil for me. But I can just imagine how my parents feel and my sister and my, my uh, family members that's older than me because I was a baby when this happened. I was only five years old, going on six. So there's a lot of things I wasn't aware of until I got older. So Lance, could you uh, please take us back to how everything transpired? Yes. Um, well, from what I know, because like I said, I was just five years old. Well, it, tra it transpired in 1996. It was, they said it was a botched robbery, but in reality, well, I can't say reality. This is just me going off my opinion. I feel like that was just a, a personal, a personal thing somebody had going on because it was not, it was no robbery. It was known that it was ten thousand dollars still in the safe of the check cash in place where this happened. So mm -hmm. this wasn't a case where it was a robbery because nothing was took, nothing was took besides two men lives. So I felt like that was personal. So um, this went, This was in December, 1996. So yeah, my brother was a teenager around this time. He worked at Old Navy and he also went to school, art and design school. So a lot of places, we lived in Corona, a lot of, in Corona, Queens, a lot of places where he went to school and went to work, it was outside of Corona, outside of uh, Queens perhaps too. He went sometimes on the outskirts of Long Island to go work and, and places like that. So um, when this happened, he was actually home and he had worked a, a night shift, a, a morning shift, you should say, where he had to be up early, get up in the middle of the night to get up to go to work early in the morning. So um, he was actually sleeping when all this actually did occur December 21st. And then December 23rd is when they came uh, and arrested my brother for this case and the two other men. The, uh, one of the men he got arrested the same day with my brother and the other man, the other man, Rohan Boat, he had got arrested two days or a day later uh, coming out of a grocery store. So do you... Are you still in touch with Gary Johnson and Rohan Bolt? Uh, I'm not personally, but my brother is. They're all in the same uh, facility together. And how often do you visit your brother? Uh, I just went to see him this past Sunday. I, I'll say at least two, three times a month. And, and you told me when we spoke before, you told me that he's always given you paperwork. He's been researching this. So these three guys have maintained their innocence all this time. Yes, yes, yes. Like I said, he always, since day one, like I went to see him with the paperwork situation. I went to go see him uh, on two different occasions about two, two years ago. And he had told me, he's like, um, I'm sending some paperwork home because I got too much of it. So at the time, I really didn't know what it was, though. He just told me that it was paperwork. So um, when I got it, I just had it in the house sitting there. And then I remember, uh, remember our phone call I told you about when I came across the article that Hannah Riley wrote. It was the summer of this year, 2019, like around May, June, June, 
I've read that article, and then since then, I started doing my own fighting on social media and trying to uh, bring awareness towards this case. So then that's when he told me, he said, all that paperwork that he said I gave you, that's a lot of my transcripts and stuff from uh, his trial dates and, um, um, uh, yeah, just stuff like that, information like that. And, oh, yeah, certain websites that he looked up um, about, like, when he was uh, searching the law and trying to find out certain motions he could file within the courts and stuff like that. So it was basically a bunch of uh, paperwork like that that had to uh, do with that. This this article by Hannah Riley, when was the first time you read this article from The Nation? Uh, I want to say June of 2019. So this article had been published for five years and you didn't even know about it. Yeah, I didn't even know about it. I was so shocked. Well, this I read this article a couple of times and Lev... You've gone through it a couple of times, right? Absolutely. And it still just shocks me how many holes there are in this case that uh, I really want more people who are in law enforcement or media to be exposed to. So I'm, I'm talking to my friend right now. Do we know if the attorney general or the DA is in charge of this case? Do we know who's in charge of the case? Uh, no, right now, I believe the Queens DA, they just have voted in a new a new uh, counsel, I think her name is Melinda Katz. So she gets sworn in in January. So right now, as far as the DA and stuff like that, like that's up in the air. So until until January, till next year, the beginning of 2020, when she gets sworn in office, and then somebody will be able to take control of the case and do something with it, move forward. So we definitely want to find out which politicians are in the district. Um, and see who maybe at the local or national level could help us. Um, maybe someone from state legislature or the House of Representatives. My friend here, he's he's just skimmed it. I've just sent it to him. He's been busy this week. Um, but I've I've been hounding him and telling him like, pay attention to this. And I think I've got I've I have finally gotten his attention. So let's see here. So he's he's reaching out to people right now. We're going to find out. We're definitely, we're going to make some noise with this. So let's see. So there's a detective referenced in the article, Detective Pete Fiorillo. Is that how you pronounce his name? Pete Fiorillo? Yes. So Pete Fiorillo is a detective that looked at this case and he has a lot of misgivings about it. And he's been troubled by this case for a long time. And apparently he's like friends with other people involved with the case, or he's a, he has their, he's acquaintances with people in the case. And so when he looked at it, he had no intention of looking at the case to take it apart. But the more he learned about it, the more his doubts grew until he became convinced that the investigation and the trial were irredeemably flawed. So I think that is very i would love to talk to him have you spoken to fiorillo anytime recently or after you read the article yes i spoke to him i'm actually uh close with him I, as far as like i could just call him on the phone and he'll pick up or if he doesn't answer he'll give me a call back but i actually spoke to him after we spoke on the phone and i gave him a heads up about what was what i was going to do and stuff and um he agreed he, he said if anything, if I arrange something to come up there to speak to you guys in person, he'll come with me and he'll speak then. Well, then we'll definitely do that. We're definitely going to follow up. And I think that would be fantastic. Um, and then there's this other person in the case, Marianne Bubblenick. Is that Bubelnik. I think it's a Bubelnik. Polish name. Yeah. That was one of the big holes that I noticed where there was an arrest of a 20-year-old John Mark Bigway, a Liberian immigrant, who was uh, dealing some uh, cannabis. And whatever he told her was not what she ended up uh, giving as a statement, according to him, where he just said that uh, he just hung out with his friends and that's it. But according to her, your brother was flashing a gun and inviting this 
guy to uh, join them in this horrible act. And this is not the first time that uh, Ms. Bubelnik was in some uh, murky waters. There was a man who sued the city of New York for uh, wrongful incarceration, according to uh, the uh, murder case which uh, she handled. So if you have somebody like that who is in charge of disseminating what the truth is, I would have thought that would raise some red flags, but apparently not. Yeah, like a lot of stuff, a lot of people that, a lot of stuff that was taken into the court by these people, like it it wasn't credible. It had no credibility. But the climate of the of where New York City was around that time, and like I said before, I told him on the phone, Rudy Giuliani was mayor around that time, mm-hmm. and this case was a huge case to them, to him, I should say. And um, so he was just pushing the button, pushing the button, and just just to know that they had somebody that they could charge for this for this case, um, that's all that mattered to them. They didn't they didn't care about what sounded what made sense or what mm-hmm. didn't make sense they didn't they they didn't bother to look into new evidence evidence was bringing forth to them they didn't bother with nothing they didn't that's why I was a juror that it was that one juror she she just stuff things just stuff just didn't make sense to her what she was hearing what they was trying to say inside the courtroom just didn't make sense to her and she had to go see she had to go to the crime scene herself to get a look at what was going what really happened if this sound possible like if that's possible what they said because it sounds impossible and stuff like that well there was also an eyewitness from a uh, pain phone who on the second time looked at uh, the people in the lineup and uh, he uh, got your brother uh, convicted. But uh, according to the Innocence Project, I witnessed misidentifications account for almost 75% of all the wrongful convictions later overturned by DNA testing. So this was not even in the morning, right? That, like this was just as the sun was starting to go up. Yes. So you're taking the word of somebody who was in the payphone 170 feet away in that dark of a climate to get some accurate information here it's ridiculous and they have and they were they were wearing hoods mm-hmm. um and the 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 if i'm not mistaken the testimony that was the the linchpin here was from someone who was pleading who, who was already in trouble for a crime and he yeah. was testifying for a special deal and a year later he was Convict and he 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 was a career criminal in and out of prison starting at seventeen. This is the testimony that this whole case relies on. And then he gets a special deal. When he gets out, he murders someone uh, like a year later. And so this is the guy who this is the guy whose word this all depends on. And it's very shaky when you do add everything else up. So. Two people were murdered. So it's called the Davis Epstein murders. Mm -hmm. And it occurred during the Giuliani era. And one of the people happened to be a cop who was uh, working. He was working as security. He was working as security. And that, and so this was at a time when Giuliani was building a reputation for himself as cleaning up crime. And he would say, if you shoot and kill a New York City police officer, the police department is going to catch you, they're going to find you, usually in a short period of time, and then at a minimum, you're going to spend the rest of your life in jail. And in this particular situation, it's quite possible you'll get executed. And so this is what Giuliani would tell reporters. And you know, this is and this is what he told reporters after a conference regarding these murders. So yes. so you're exactly right. Giuliani specifically was pushing the button on this case. And let's see, according, according to police reports, the NYPD officers stopped 6,000 cars and interviewed more than 1,000 people looking yeah. for anyone with outstanding warrants. And they put posters up all over town offering a $10,000 reward for information about the case. So, you know, I, I think a lot of people in this day and age, a lot of people watch Netflix documentaries or they listen to podcasts like Serial and things like that, you know, and even still, a lot of people grew up with CSI and crime dramas, um, you know, forensics, detectives, and things like that. And you hear all these stories of 
um, coerced confessions, false confessions, where you, you grab someone up who's very young, he doesn't know his rights, it's like 4.30 in the morning, whatever time it is, mm-hmm. and you got these guys threatening you and putting a piece of paper in front of you and saying, sign this piece of paper and all of this will end, right? They didn't record their interrogation. There's no record of the interrogation, but they've got this signed piece of paper and George Bell, your brother, has, like, has said that it was a coerced confession, which does bring its validity into question. Um, and, and you can see with the frenzy that was surrounding this case mm-hmm. that they were really just trying to strong arm and railroad this through. And I, I think that's what Detective Pete Fiorillo, who's a like, career professional, I, I think that's what he also believes in his heart. It's just the evidence does not justify these convictions. I, th- I think it's just a matter of getting people to read this article, getting the right people to read mm-hmm. this article, talking to Pete, talking to the other detectives, doing a couple interviews. Why not? Why not try to get Kim Kardashian or someone to look at this or someone with um, connections in the police department or with political connections? I think we should have the highest standards for justice. And it's unacceptable to me personally to, yeah. to be aware of a story like this and to feel like Lev and I can make a difference and for us to, to not help amplify this to the absolute extent of our abilities. Yes. So to think that the two people here was a young man who was working at Old Navy and uh, a 35-year-old owner of an East Elmhurst Caribbean restaurant who's also a father of two. Those do not seem to be very likely murderers. Yo, hey, everything, everything, I don't mean to cut you off. That's because that's the second time this happened. Everything you said, I said the same thing to myself because you see how uh, he was just saying, he probably was just saying about how this guy had, um, he had a history. He had a history. Of, he was a career criminal doing this and doing mm-hmm. that. If you look at George, George, George don't have no history. He didn't have no history. He went to school and mm-hmm. he went to work. And he just liked to buy clothes and that's it. He liked to have girls, different girlfriends, and that was it. He didn't even care about cars. He liked to take trains. You know, in the nineties. The trains was fun and stuff like that. Plus, take it, you know. But um, <laughs> so uh, when you even look at this, look at his background, then you try to, and then you try to wrap your mind around how did he just become a murderer overnight? It does not make sense. No, of course not. And the guy, the other cryptic thing here is you have the uh, owner of the check cashing place, Ira Epstein, who told his wife on the day that he went out that uh, he knew that uh, he would never see her again. Uh, that That's what she told the yeah. press. Oh, my. <laughs> yes, yes. And then that's the thing. Why would you feel like, why, why does he have to tell, why does he feel like that? Like, what made him feel that he would never see you again? Oh, you know what I'm saying? And then it's good mm-hmm. that she said that publicly too. That's on public record because yeah. that's telling you that he was in fear of his life for whatever reason. That's right. And and then he was killed in the store while he has this police officer as security and there was ten thousand dollars left behind, so nothing was stolen. So yeah. so it wasn't a robbery. There was no robbery. Yeah. And then it's yeah, in the beginning when I said they said it was a botch robbery going wrong. Nothing was going wrong. It was never no botch robbery. It was that's they just went. That was just it sounds it. like the wrong place at the wrong time. It's yeah, it really yeah, sounds for, like wrong place in the wrong time. Yeah, well, like I, for 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 uh, the guy to say that is a possibility you might I might not make it home tonight. He was in fear of his life, right? And so I I believe it was meant for him and the security that was a cop, a undercover cop at the time. He was the innocent bystander, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Because I believe 
they probably was going to do that to the security guard either way. Mm-hmm. And then that, and then I also question, how come he has security? But then that's when somebody tried to tell me, oh, some tech cash, some tech cash managers work with security and stuff like that. I was like, I well, how know. how safe was that neighborhood during that time? Uh, I don't believe it was dangerous at all. I don't. I don't know because I can't really. I wasn't. I wasn't old enough to live it, mm-hmm. so to, to to be there and understand. Well, this is a little bit after the, uh, as they call it, the bad old days of New York City, which I think reached its peak at around the time when we got here. I originally came from uh, Russia, from Saint Petersburg, Russia, and my grandma almost got robbed one time when she was walking around uh, Foster Avenue where we used to live, and that was around ninety four, I believe. So, mm. yeah, ninety four. That was yeah. <laughs> Force to add, what's that? That's Brooklyn. Yeah, that's Brooklyn. Yeah. That's... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not 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 a not a great place to uh, hang around, especially at night. But uh, yeah. that that's why I'm very divided when it comes to the implementations mm-hmm. that were made by Giuliani, because on one hand we did end up having a safer city. I mean, right now New York's like uh, Disneyland. And yeah. back then, since it was so dangerous, I could see why certain policies like that ended up working. But the problem is that when you have this, I mean, I'm not a big fan of the term collateral damage because it sounds so, you know, so clean while really mm-hmm. it's anything but. But I just think that that kind of stuff, the short term thinking, just because you're trying to, uh, you know, because you're trying to show everybody how good of a mayor you are, it's going to backfire in terms of the lack of trust that communities are going to develop as far as uh, their relationship with the police go. Yeah, look at, look at Mike Bloomberg. He just apologized the other day. He said, I apologize for uh, the stop and frisk policy that he had going on for about five years, I believe, or something like that. He said, I didn't realize how much damage it could cause to families. So it's mm-hmm. like, and now he want to run for president. Um, because here's the thing, the, even with the Giuliani thing, he, that he, his legacy is strongly contested. You know, the book Freakonomics uh, has all sorts, has a whole chapter dedicated to saying that Giuliani actually didn't do anything to help the city, that it was all just PR and like, you know, headlines and things like that. But if you look at the source of the crime drop, it had a lot more to do with birth rates. That's what Freakonomics says which is according to a lot of people that is the authority on the reality of giuliani's legacy at the end of the day i think it just really comes down to morality and like we have ideals and i i love i do love how this article ends like having one innocent person locked away is inexcusable And there was that case recently that was being talked about, this Rodney Reed case, which is a lot more questionable than this. This case has nothing to do, like like Rodney Reed, they were scrubbing his criminal history, all sorts of other problems that he had just because they were anti-death penalty, right? They were trying to create a news story to get him off because they just don't believe in the sentence, but they were completely manipulative with how they were re-presenting him. And none of that is going on here. This is a very straightforward story about a miscarriage of justice. There's no ulterior motive here other than we became aware of this story by chance, by randomness, through the universe. We came across this story. I found your social media and, you know, we've, we've given it some time. We've looked through it and I was just scratching my head going like, wait a second. Like, I feel like it's my duty. Like, like if I believe something to be injustice, as I've gathered from this story with my familiarity with this case, so far, I just feel compelled to speak up because what the heck is going on here? It, it just seems like because of its political background that people have not been motivated to touch it yet because 
they're thinking about their their careers in yes. politics or in law enforcement, and they're not just thinking about people's lives. Wow. Yes, yes, you hit it right on the head because that's exactly what it is. Because you see how you mentioned Kim Kardashian, this person, this person. But then it's like once these people view it and then once they see, it's like when everybody sees that it's a cop, nobody wants nothing to do with it. Well, I think that can change. I think, I think especially when you have this detective who's an NYPD detective who's also amplifying his misgivings, I think it's time to get some, some new blood to look at this. Mm. It says a lot that this article was published in 2014 and Lance, George's brother, didn't even know about it, right? You didn't even know about this story for five years and here it is. And Hannah Riley has laid it out very meticulously here. And I think it's time to say what's up. Um, and that's what we want to help you do. What would, what would you, Lance, what would you want our next steps to be? What can we do to help you beyond what we're currently doing? Um, exactly what we're doing right now. We're just taking one step at a time because as we go on, it's going to, uh, the story's going to get out there to more people. Um, I just feel like, we want to just want to talk about my brother's personality, him as a person, because even though he's going, he went through this and still is going through this still to this day, he still remains his innocence. He still remain, uh, remains his sanity. He still remains healthy. He keeps his mind, mind occupied. He stays busy. And he's still the same person even when from when he was home. Like, he didn't change. Mm-hmm. He's still... I show you pictures of him, or I sent. I saw. I showed you. You can look on my Instagram. Like he still dresses nice. He doesn't. He doesn't let things get him down or make him look sad or make him look mad or angry. He's real. He's real. Uh, he's real. He's real. Got it intact right now. He's got it intact, and I just want to talk about him as a person. And um, yeah, definitely how he. He, he he's wrongfully uh, convicted right now. He's never had any disciplinary problems. Yeah, no, no, no tickets, no nothing since he's in there. And and even since he's been in, he's never been in the box. He's never had nope. any. I got, mm, no, no, I got problems, his, right? Yeah, no, I got his track record of everything that he's completed of um since he's been inca- incarcerated, wow. stuff that he's obtained and things like that. When you were uh, speaking with him, did he uh, say how he was able to maintain a distance from a lot of these negative elements in jail? Because I figure like the the stereotype is you go to jail, you have to join a gang or all that stuff. Like, yeah. what's the reality here? Yeah, see, his his situation is a whole lot of different from your average inmate inside prison because since day one, even even the other two guys, uh, Gary Johnson and Rohan Boat because George was the one that's charged with the murder. They're charged with a robbery. That's why I said this case, they said botch robbery, mm. right, going wrong. So George Bell is so-called the shooter. He's the one who got murdered. He's the one who has natural life. Gary has 50 to life and Rohan has 25 to life. If he doesn't have 50 to life too. He either has 25 or 50 to life, but George has natural life. So I say that to say, he don't have to worry about other inmates. It was police who was treating him wrong in the beginning. When he, when he was 19 years old, when this happened. So when he goes up, he's a 19 year old kid going upstate, going far away, eight hours away. And he's there for killing the cop supposedly. So you can just imagine how he was treated by the COs. So I can't even imagine like, and and he's still here to this day. And I just thank God for that. He doesn't have no, he has no long-term damages on his, on his skin. Everything's fine. He don't have no uh, scars on his face or. Thank God. Yeah. Thank God for that. Thank God for that. Ah, This is such a tough story. Well, I definitely, we're, we, we are on this. So thank you, Lance, for joining us and for sharing a little bit of your story. I'm sorry for this nightmare 
you and your family has been going through for so long. I really look forward to talking to uh, the detective Pete Fiorillo and uh, would love to try to talk to the author of this article, Hannah Riley. Um, and I mean, even if we could talk to Marianne, uh, Lev, you pronounce it, Babelnik. Babelnik. I didn't find anything on her online. Yeah, I, don't I don't know where she is. Yeah, yeah she's I, I defunct. I don't have uh, information either. <laughs> yeah, she, she, she had a lot of cases overturned. Apparently, there was a lot of malpractice. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it, it's, it, it is, it does seem to me to be an irredeemably flawed case. And I think um, we have to do something about it. Yes. Yes. And I appreciate you for having me. And next one, we're going to do a video. Like I said, this was just a little, this is just a warm up for me. But yeah, I have no problem with doing the video. And yeah, thanks again. Thank, Thank you, Lance. You, Lance. All right. We'll talk soon. Have a good night. All right. Have a good night.